Time to welcome our next speaker. So our next speaker is Walter Neiten, and he will talk about RX environments, reactive multi-agent environments. Please join me in welcoming the speaker. Am I on? All right, nice. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Wouter. I'm a PhD student uh, here in Eindhoven, University of Eindhoven, and I will uh, talk you through my new package called RX Environments JL, uh, which are called Reactive Multi-Agent Environments. So first, I'll talk you kind of through the problem that RX Environments is trying to solve, uh, and then I'll talk you through how RX Environments solved this problem, and I'll give a live demo of, uh, of what the package does. So Arcs Environments is concerned with agent-environment interactions. Um, so an agent is a system that perceives an environment in which it lives and which can uh, exert actions in order to change the internal state of the environment that it lives in. Um, so these are mostly agents that you see in like reinforcement learning or like control theory, stuff like that. Um, usually there is some desired environment state that we have to realize, some, some, some goal that we have uh, for the agent. And RX Environments is, is specifically uh, a package to design the environment in which your agent lives. So a popular uh, framework or a popular protocol for environment design is that whenever my agent emits an action, uh, the environment will take this action, will step the environment one time step forward in time, and then emits an observation with a reward. So this protocol is used by both reinforcement learning JL and stuff like OpenAI Gymnasium. And you can see in the, in the, um, the function signatures from both these packages, which are, which are down, down there, um, that there is no notion of the time step or of different agents or, uh, or whatever. It's just we have the environment, we have one action, and that's the only protocol that we have. That's the only thing we can use to let the environment step forward in time. Um, but what if we have different sensors that operate on different frequencies for our agent? For example, we have a, a, a spot by, uh, by Boston Dynamics. This thing has um, like proprioceptive uh, sensors in, uh, in all motors. It has a camera. It has a microphone. There's all kinds of sensors. And with the previous protocol, you cannot really encode this information because all of these sensors run on a different, um, a different time frequency. Um, so what if we have multiple agents in the same environment? My laptop seems to freeze. Um, this is a very famous football goal from 2014. I would have loved, or this is Robin van Persie's goal against the Spanish. Um, I would have loved to play the Spanish again on Sunday, but unfortunately we lost. Um, but in an environment like this, so if we would have a football environment, we would have 22 agents all in the same environment. And what if you then have, like, all of these agents would have to emit a certain action before the environment can step forward? And with the algorithm the protocol that we just saw, it's not really possible to have, like, one agent or two agents or five agents because all we have in order to step the environment forward is just this one step function that takes one action. Um, or what if, like, Spanish goalkeeper Iker Casillas is demonstrating for us, want to do nothing? <laughs> Uh, do, do, do we include like a nothing action? I mean, it, it's kind of an awkward protocol for, for designing, uh, uh, designing our environments. So that's why I coined something that I call a reactive environment. It's an environment in which an agent can send or receive an observation or an action at any point in time. Um, so as we can see in this video, what if I, when I'm golfing, I hit this ball. So the action is I hit the ball and then I just let it roll. I don't want to emit any more actions. I just want to let it roll. So this is a separation between two kinds of states for the environment. One is a state which I can influence. And then there is a state that just kind of changes when, we, when it evolves over time. So I can influence a state on, uh, of the environment, but I can also just, there's also just the flow of time which changes the state of, of, uh, of the environment. And these are two internal and external processes that we should, we should clearly separate. So yeah, instead of having this, this, this explicit protocol of, of uh, interaction, I just want agents to listen and environments to listen 
and for everything to just happen like it, like it would in real life. Um, so f how I'm going to realize that is through reactive programming, which is a declarative programming paradigm where we basically only show how we handle certain events. And then by letting these events happen, like the, the control flow kind of appears. It's uh, implemented in Julia by Observable GL, Reactive GL, Rocket GL. There are all kinds of packages to get reactive uh, behavior inside of your, your Julia uh, functions. So Arcs Environments GL is a particular implementation of reactive environments in Rocket. Um, as a user, you should just define how your environment should react to certain actions, to certain impulses, what would change in the uh, internal state, and also how this internal state evolves over time. And then um, Arcs Environments will just do the rest. It will manage this network of subscriptions for you. It will uh, make sure that the right messages, the right actions are delivered at the right places. So it's kind of like a plumber, but then for your environment design. Um, so how is it used? You just write your environment, and then you wrap it in the Arcs environment method, which is kind of decorates your environment with with this behavior. Um, you can add agents to this environment with the add uh, bang function. You can delete them with unsubscribe, bang. Uh, and there's basically only three functions that you have to implement. What to send, so what is my agent going to receive as an observation from the environment? Receive, bang, how is the internal state of my environment going to change when I receive an action? And update, bang, how is the uh, internal state of my environment going to evolve over time. Um, so the design philosophy of, of Rx environments is basically that, indeed, all agents, all environments, they have internal states and they have interaction states. So uh, if I kick a ball, I interact with the environment, but the internal state is really just the position and velocity of the ball. So if we borrow this a bit from active inference literature, we have a Markov blanket, where every agent has a set of sensors, a set of actuators. The environment also has sensors and actuators, and they're kind of like symmetrically linked together. Um, this doesn't stop us from hooking up multiple agents to the same environment. So we can have a second agent that also has sensors, actuators. We hook, hook it up to the environment. Um, and if we look at this figure, Kind of the only thing that's different between an agent and an environment is that I wrote agent or environment inside of this, this box. So in Arcs environments, I implemented like a super, super type, uh, which, is, which I call an entity. And every all logic is implemented on the entity level. So just take that out. Agents and environments, they're basically like the same thing. They can just react onto each other. So with Rx environments, you can model agent-to-agent -agent interactions if you'd want to, or you can make composite environments, which are like hooked up onto each other. You can, you can go completely crazy with this. So here we go, live demo time. Can I do this code? Well, this is probably small, isn't it? So I have prepared for you a mountain car uh, environment. Here we go, a plot. This is visible, isn't it? This is. So the mountain car is quite a well-known uh, environment from reinforcement learning, where we have this landscape, uh, and we have a car uh, which is inside of this valley. And it's supposed to drive out of this valley, but by its engine force alone, it's not able to go out. So it has to kind of swing and use gravitation to its advantage. So let's send an, uh, a command to this, to this agent. We have this throttle function, and we see live that this this guy is going going left, like he's or right, and then he's going left, and we can make him swing, and it's, it's all all fun and games. Then, okay, let's let's make sure he, he he actually gets out of the valley. So, I have some for loop that does something. It 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 waits a little bit and then swings this this throttle. While he's busy, let's add a second agent because we can do this. Now there's a second agent, and we can also control this guy. We can just go crazy with this. Then, I don't know, let's do something like, like this, like agent is add agent. Like, let's do like this. And then how are we going to control this? Uh, minus 1 plus 0 0.2 times i. It should spawn like 10 agents. 
There we go. The font larger like this. So now we have like 10 agents. They live here. They're doing their stuff. We can see the results live. And with the same code, I can do one agent, 10 agents. Doesn't matter. Like, I can, I can go crazy with this. Um, so we can push it even further with the football, uh, football analogy. We can make a football environment, like a pitch, like you can see behind me. Uh, <laughs> And grass we can still compile it? What? At grass still compile? Grass is still compiling. Ah, it's you know, this is supposed to be a digital twin. So on my PC it's compiled. Uh, and we can have a player, we can put him in, we can make him run around. So we have a, a player and I just send some random commands. And uh, I mean he's running around, he's having fun. Um, and with the same code, I can play a 3v1 game. So um, I can put three uh, players of the red team, then one player of the blue team. And with the same code, we can have them play together. Um, and we can even go further and simulate a full 11 v 11. So this is all with exactly the same environment code. We just show, we just code how the environment should react to the different actions of the players, and it will just resolve itself. So I couldn't really uh, design an intelligent agent, so I just made them do random stuff. Uh, but there is, yeah, there, there is more. So we have all kinds of control over when we want to emit stuff to our agents. We, you, you get fine-grained control over every single step in this emission graph. Um, you, you, you get control over the speed of your environment. So if you want to design a controller, but it takes up too much compute, you can just say that my environment time is going to be twice as slow as real time. So we can kind of demo with computationally more expensive controllers and then see how they, how they behave in a, in, in a real digital twin. Um, and everything is based on Rocket. So we have native support for Arcs and FurJL based um, agents as like these guys were. This is a, a project from my master's th uh, thesis student. Thanks, Felix. Um, but this is all uh, being controlled by Arcs and Fur agents. Um, so that natively works. So what is it not? So right now, or it will never be, it will never be a package containing an environment zoo. I want to make a separate package that ships like all kinds of default control theory environments, like reinforcement learning environments. But I don't want to pollute the base repository with that. So for now, it's only boilerplate code. Um, there are examples uh, in the documentation of like mountain car and like windy grid world, stuff like that. It's also definitely not a differential equation solver. So even though you have to specify how your uh, uh, environment evolves over time, please just use differential equations if you want to solve differential equations, right? Differential equations jail is an amazing ecosystem. Just use that and then use the result of that in Arcs environments jail. So this is the end of my presentation. If you want to try it out, it's available on the registry. If you like the talk or the package, please leave a star on GitHub. I'd really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to take them. And I rushed. Holy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> any questions? There's a question on the left. Oh. Hi. Thank you. Um, you briefly mentioned that there was support for Rx infer. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have an example of how that would look? Uh, in code, no. <laughs> uh, like, not something that I can demo right now. Okay. Um, but, I mean, I could show you after the presentation. It's not something that I can do live on a stage. Thank you. Uh, OK, I have a question. Um, so at, at, at what? Uh, how many agents can I actually add? Like, did you test how does it scale? Can I add a million agents interacting, or uh, or, so, or or maybe it's ten thousand? Or it it depends on how uh, expensive your function is that that basically computes this this over time. So, for example, for this football environment, like because actually moving these agents, uh, it solves a differential equation under the hood to move them. Uh, through time, so 22 agents uh, was already like quite expensive. Um, it also depends on your update frequency. So, do you really want these guys to update every millisecond, or is it okay if they update like every second? Uh, hundreds of thousands. I mean, you you probably can if your transition functions are really cheap, but that's kind of 
mainly your your depending factor. Over there. Mikola. All right. So uh, I was wondering, I saw that it was based on observables, right? No, it's based on rocket. Rocket. Okay, no. Okay. But um, I would imagine, but it works kind of in a similar way. I, more yeah. Do you know if it has easy integration with Mackie to make, uh, what's it called, interactive environments where you can actually do drag and drop on the on the environment? Because that would be super cool. Uh, I have tried to integrate it with Maki. Like these plots are, are it's not an integrate, it's I hacked Maki kind of into this, but I cannot uh, yet pull anything from Maki. But in theory, it's possible because actually the thing that plots it is just another entity that listens. So it's just another thing in this compute graph that listens to the environment that you want to plot and it just doesn't send anything back. So the communication protocol is there, but since since Maki is based on observables and and this is based on on Rocket, that was uh, it was quite difficult to hack this one way interaction into it and and sending anything back is yeah because that's why I was asking because I mis mis misunderstood that point but that would uh, but still probably still possible to do right so yes in theory yes okay a question the left Andreas. um this looks like a game engine basically that you developed. Like under the hood, is it a game engine? Like, is it this entity component system kind of thing, or can you make some comments about the architecture? Basically, is what I'm asking. In in theory, yes. But if you say game engine, then usually people think of like graphics engine, phys physics engine, and kind of all that. Those things are not in there. It's it's purely a communication protocol with like uh, time sync uh, uh, communication. That or asynchronous communication, basically. Um, so, I mean, you could ho hook it up, probably, to, well, I did with differential equations. Maybe you can hook it up to Mujoko, something like that. Um, and then, sure, but like, it, in a traditional sense, it's not a game engine. OK, but like, what, what's the general architecture? Like, do we have like, any fancy data structures, or is it just like, a vector of entities? Or um, What do you mean? For example, I think one very common uh, optimization is that you have this um, struct of arrays uh, data structure because you have many entities with the same uh, properties. Do you employ any such things or? Yeah, in a, yeah, yeah, I do. I haven't. Mm, yes, I do. In a sense, it's just a, a, um, an array of, of entities that know how to communicate with each other, um, and I managed kind of the the yeah the the plumbing work for that in order to make sure that what you send ends up at the right place. OK. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. More questions from the audience? There's yes, yes. plenty of time. Um, do you have some project that uh, uses data from real sense or? Not yet. So the idea is indeed that this is able to m mimic in some way a real sensor, because you can, you can actually live ch or determine the emission frequency. Um, but I haven't, I haven't done that yet. I first want to integrate it with Rx and Fur such that I have like a, a decent controller to control something in real time and then maybe swap it out to see how good the digital twin actually is. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have, do we have more questions from the audience? Still plenty of time for discussion if someone wants to ask, ask something. Yep, we have a question over here. Uh, so, you, you mentioned about the uh, reinforcement learning environment and uh, open edging. So could, could you like explain why do you want to like re remove the step because you still need to somehow determine the frequency. And that is kind of the reason you have the, the step because you, you can uh, it, it basically like each time step you, you got a, a step. Sure. but. Uh, with this framework, your action frequency does not have to match the frequency of your sensors per se. So not every time you get an observation from your sensors, you have to do something. Or what if I have multiple sensors, like I have camera and a microphone. So my microphone will trigger at like 44 kilohertz. Do I let my 
step be one over 44,000 of a second and then once every 200 samples I include uh, an image that comes from my camera and the rest of the time it's nothing and, and, and I have to emit an action 44,000 times a second. I don't really want to do that. I just want to, you know, get uh, sensor data when it arrives and, 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 and send stuff whenever I want to send stuff. So does that mean like the controller have like different uh, action when they take different kind of sensors data? Yes, and yes, and it doesn't necessarily have to be on the same frequency as your as your sensors. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have more questions? Yep, we have a question in the middle. Uh, hello. Uh, do you think this is something that can only be done in a simulation, like this reactive paradigm, or can it also be uh, used in a real robot? Um, I don't know enough about robotics to really give an insightful comment about that. I, I built it to get as close to how, you know, uh, a, a close enough digital twin to a robot, but I don't know about the actual implementations in robotics, whether or not it would be, would be feasible. Mm -hmm. okay. We have a question on the top right. Um, yeah, uh, thanks. Very nice talk. I'm, I'm, more, I'm curious about the plumbing, um, a little bit more that you didn't talk about. Um, so you talked about different frequencies that, you know, your different sensors provide. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do internally? Uh, because, you know, the computer eventually has a clock cycle. Um, so how, how do you do that? And is it, is it efficient in a way that you could, it would scale up to, you know, many, many sensors at that receive data at high rates? It, it depends on what you define by many, many sensors. Is it like 15 sensors or like a million? Um, well, let's think about a million. A million sensors would probably not scale very well. Um, in, in the same way as, as uh, Dimitri asked, is basically just um, if I have a million sensors, I kind of have a million entities that emit on a, on a different frequency and my agent will, well, it will get a lot of messages, like seriously, a lot of messages. Um, so probably the, the plumbing work would then dominate the time um, that I can actually use for computation, um, if, if, if that answers your question. Um, well, uh, partly yes, but, um, but how does the plumbing work? You said you have this, um, you know, this array of, of entities which are structs or something like that. You scan through them on a regular cycle to decide what happens to uh, what has to happen. Ah uh, no. Um, so um, the agent is subscribed to a sensor. So whenever the sensor emits, the agent will be notified, and a packet of data will be sent, which you 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 have full control over what will be sent, whether it be data or like a, a notifier or whatsoever. Uh, but this is kind of the computational speed up of why I use reactive programming is because I don't have to scan through like arrays and arrays of who's subscribed to who or, or where, where do I have to send what um, because I subscribe from A to B whenever this thing emits all its subscribers will be notified. So I, I only compute when it's, when it's strictly necessary and I don't do something every clock cycle whatsoever. Um, okay and the rocket, uh, so the <clears throat> yeah, the actual communication is then happen, um, is yes. done by rocket, probably, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. What RX Environments does is make sure that, that uh, so rocket actually delivers the message and then the RX Environments kind of exposes the internal state of the, of the entity to you and it will, um, so it, it will basically abstract this story of entities away for you such that you do just have to uh, write synchronous code and it will turn it into a reactive rocket under the hood. Okay, cool. Thanks. Do you have any further questions? Okay. If uh, there are no more questions, let's uh, thank the speaker one more time.